very strange dilemma because uh, I quite like material things. So I, I quite like building, you know, my earthly grave. I like books. I like my belongings. And on the, on the other hand, um, strangely enough, um, I'm really not afraid of death. And not because it could be far. It can be tomorrow or it can be in a few hours. Um, I'm, we expect it to be far. I expect maybe to have time, but I don't have a clue. Um, maybe for one very simple reason, because I expect what should be to happen and what is, well, God to be good and just. I'm not worthy, I'm a sinner, I will be sad not to have said goodbye to those I should say goodbye to, and not to have settled what should be settled. Um, but um, how do we deal with that? Because of if I got you right, we shouldn't grow roots here, and we shouldn't feel too comfortable in this world, because if we feel too comfortable here, we won't feel like following Christ, and we will get uh, remain stuck here. Well, you see, this word of idea, <coughs> this idea of following Christ, we all want to succeed in this life. We all want, all want to leave a mark, leave some sort of inheritance behind yes. us, so that the world reminds us, uh, remembers ourselves, and so on. But if we are truly followers of Christ, I know of no greater loser than Christ. Because what did he leave behind in the hour of his death? Nothing. Nothing. He didn't build anything. He didn't write any books. The people he had instructed completely failed to understand what he was saying and abandoned him. He in himself did not come to terms with the idea of death because look at his last words yes. as a human being, not as God. Uh, although, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to say that. I'm always, I always find out I um, end up being heretical because I speak God. So I don't, I don't really know. The idea is that he, he left nothing behind. That's not his aim. So if anything, if you want to follow Christ, again, look at what he left behind. Look at what he achieved. Look at someone like St. John the Baptist as well. We know nothing of St. John except that he ate lo locusts. Locust. Uh, yeah. locust. And he, he had, you know, hairy... F Clothes. That's all we know. He didn't have a career. He didn't have a family or wife or children. He didn't build up a following. He didn't found anything. He was decapitated. He, he was a complete loser. Here. Yes. I mean, the, you, you have to look at these things and ask yourself why. You know, we, we, there's no... Yeah. And concerning death, yes. so. I don't think you know what death is, with all due love and You're probably right. You're probably right. And by that I don't mean, you know, no, no. You, you may have seen people die and things like yes. that. I've seen people die in my, in, in my arms. I mean, but they've you died mean another death. death? There is, no, there's just a different way of experiencing death that, that just comes upon you when you least want it or expect it, literally out of nowhere brought about by the silliest mm. things in your life mm. and then you realize one that you have no faith mm -hmm. two you have no trust in god you don't really believe in god you have no real relationship with god you are absolutely desperate because there's nothing of you that can possibly survive this existence sorry and then you, you kind of can talk about being afraid of death or not being afraid of death. I almost, uh, it already happened to me that I almost died. Uh, and when I say almost, I, I really wasn't sure if I would make it or if I would die. Yeah. Um, and um, it, it doesn't make me feel more comfortable because when I think of all the failures uh, I had after that, I was like, uh, was <laughs> I'm really not worthy of the second chance God is giving me, uh, but um, no, no, uh, um, but um, there's something in the way Christ himself is not at peace on the cross, so to say. There's something about Christ not being at peace when he sees Lazarus dead and weeping and feeling discomfort and being, being troubled inside and 
I don't believe we can come to terms to death in any way. Um, that's the last enemy. Uh, yeah. I think because of the way I grew up, constantly moving and not really feeling that I have a culture or a country or a people of my own, I've never felt that I belong anywhere. But, and sometimes people have pointed out that maybe this is God's way of forcing you to see that you don't, you, as much as you may want to, you don't actually really mm-hmm. you know, belong on this planet. You don't, not that you, know, you shouldn't be alive, but you shouldn't. So I've, I'm forced yeah. to live with the fact that I don't belong anywhere, but it's difficult, and I don't know how to live with that. It's extremely difficult. It's, uh, it's difficult enough for the Celtic saints to consider that a special type of uh, martyrdom. What did they call it? Green martyrdom? Yeah. Green martyrdom. To always leave behind the moment you feel you are rooted somewhere. Always uproot yourself and move forward. Always leave your country, always leave your family to, to focus on the destination, which is Christ. It is supposed to be hard. It is martyrdom. Because what do you do in practice? You kill. Every time you move, you kill a version of yourself that could have grown in that context. How does that time with... You have other saints that say that um, one can become holy where they are. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? How does that tie in with that? Because you get people that say, right, I need to leave, I need to go so that I'm on my own. Well, but when I say go, I don't necessarily mean physically. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've lived in Romania all my life. I never yeah. belonged. I've lived in a monastery yeah. all my life. I, I, I mean, five to six years in Moldavia. I never belonged. Uh, I'm now building this monastery, and already my thinking is, so where am I going to live? once it's finished. You don't have to live physically to know that you don't belong. Um, and again, it's not about not having relationships, health uh, relationships and so on, because marriage is possible and so on, but it's just about, and it's not, again, it's not something you have to believe or not believe. It's something you have to acknowledge within yourself. The, some of the loneliest people I have met are married long marriages and good marriages i mean you know not you know marriages that fail them they get along wonderfully they talk to each other they but there's just something of you that you will never be able to communicate and the more aware you are of that the more alone you feel and the more painful it is actually if you are surrounded by a community be that a monastery or a family i believe in honesty that's that's my that's my I believe in honesty. I'm alone, so I'd rather just be alone physically as well. Uh, but that's my take. I would have, I'm sorry Father Merkisadek had to go, because I would have uh, liked to push him a bit further. Uh, he said at one point that monasticism is essentially a community thing, and I, I, I disagree with that entirely. But I would have liked to discuss that with him. Mm. Monasticism is such a rich tradition. It has everything in it, from people living in lavras of over 1,000 people to, you know, smaller monasteries, skits of three, five people, hermits living alone, um, you know, people living up in trees or digging holes into the ground or um, into hills and the Celts living their lives, monastic lives, in boats going to America and back. And monasticism is whatever crazy thing you feel in your heart. Basically, you just create the space and the context for you to truly follow whatever God, you know, inspires you to do. And if you've got the confirmation of your spiritual father, just go for it. What's there to lose? That's something else. We we are so afraid. What's there really to lose in one's life? What's there to, to, to gain or lose? I mean, time goes by anyway. Whatever money you make, you will spend. Or even if you don't spend it when you die, it's not completely useless. The houses you have after you go are just going to be there, so they are useless. What, what do you gain? What, you will find something to eat. I mean, you can't eat. A person eats just as much regardless of their salary. 
A person can only have one roof above their head at a time, regardless. Of, you might have ten palaces or castles, but you can't be in all of them at the same time. You'll still be just under one every time you, you know. So what's there to lose? Your health? Well, I'm sorry to break the news. You will lose that. Sooner or later, you will lose that. So, you know, don't tame yourselves. Well, not just don't tame, don't reduce yourself. Don't just be wild beasts. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's your life. And the thing that you said about when you, when you said about going to the nightclub and knowing the crisis we do there. Yeah. Um, when I, a lot of people know here, but before I came back to church and decided to start taking things seriously, it was one of my favourite things to do. <laughs> go to a nightclub and do the usual clean, clean, dance, whatever. Um, when I decided to start taking church more seriously, going to church, doing, taking the faith more seriously, I still loved going to the nightclub. But, and I did go, but I'd be there, and one minute I'd be dancing or whatever, and the next minute I'd think, oh, he's here. Mm-hmm. And then that slowly, slowly, that mm-hmm. kind of made me not want to go there. I didn't want to take Christ in my yeah. life. And that's why I think when you have that um, conviction that he yeah. is there, the problem, the, the, basically the reason why we sin is because we forget that. Yeah. That's the, the, the my father confessed, so when I started confessing, I was 19. I still have the same priest I confessed to the first time. Um, and I've lived in Russia, I've lived in the UK, I've lived in America. I, I, I just go back and forth and I hold on to him. Speaking of spiritual fathers, it takes work, it takes sacrifice in terms of money, time, uh, you know, adjusting your schedule to go and see him and so on. But he never ever told me to stop, for instance, going to nightclubs. He didn't tell me, you know, keep on going, or <laughs> it's a good thing. But he never told me stop doing it. And I, I think the reason he did that was because he wanted me to come to the realization that it's actually something I should perhaps give up. Yeah. But it's the freedom of it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. A good, a good priest will always respect that. Always. Mm. Always. Uh, don't push me on freedom because I'm bad. <laughs> 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 yeah. You mentioned Father about um, giving 100% of yourself to whatever it is that you do. Yeah. And you gave the example of the painter. How do you give 100% without then entangling yourself so much into the world? Because mm-hmm. it seems like it would be quite difficult to give 100% and not quite easily lose the plot or be led astray in some way. I think if you give 100%, you'll realize very soon that it's a dead end. Yeah. If you give 80%, you could spend your whole life thinking there is an end at the end of this. Right. Mm-hmm. Just go all the way. And <clears throat> you know, now that I, I've been to the States so much, because that's really. All of us here should tonight just say a prayer for Americans, because if this monastery is founded in 2018, that's the deadline, it will be because of their sacrifice. Financially, 90-95% of the funds have come from those people. So honestly, just at least a good thought, if not a prayer, to those people. Um, What did I want to say? Sorry, could you, if you, if you the question was, how do you balance giving 100% to um, whatever, your, you know, whatever your job is or something like that versus not being then tangled up in the world and kind of losing I have no idea what I want you to say. It was something about America, but then anyway. <laughs> um, the, 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 the real answer was that at the beginning, just because if you do it 100%, uh, 100% you'll get to the realization that it's a dead end quickly enough for you to still have time to make the journey back, like the prodigal son. And there's actually something good about disengaging from everything and focusing on something alone, somehow. Even in terms of, of, I mean, in in a bad way. I mean, if if you if you only if you are going to be a painter 100%, you will have the time to come back. If you want to be a Christian in the sense of you know find your identity in Christ again 100%, I I also think disengaging is good. And by that, I also mean disengaging from books and uh, and even even youth groups like this. <laughs> uh, there's something there's something wrong about just 
if you keep on asking the same question, what that really tells Christ is that you don't trust him. Ask once and accept it. Because if you keep on, and there's something about silence as well. I mean, you see, just before he came here to give his talk, Father Melchizedek went outside for a few minutes. Uh, and I'm sure he did that because he needed to just let go of every one of us and all the conversations we've had and just engage in the conversations that matter to him. That's something that we, we get lost in very frequently today. We personally get lost in conversations that are not vital to us. To tell you the truth, I'm extremely happy I didn't make it in time for the hot potato thing last night. Because my answer would have been, this is irrelevant, this is not vital, this is not a real concern. <laughs> I mean, really, does it really change your life if you wear a scarf or not? That's the answer. I mean, that's, that, it's an example. That's, this is not something vital. That's not, where, that's not what's going to help you overcome death or fail death. There are other things that you should focus on and disengage, just force, enforce silence on, on these things. And not us individually, but the church as well should be doing the same thing. I believe the church today is getting caught in noise, a lot of noise, a lot of questions that are not our own. Our only question, our only conversation, as persons and as a church, should be with Christ. Everything else is just noise. And to engage with those and disengage with Christ is to lose a direction and to waste time. Uh, yeah. It's very difficult to shut out the noise, um, especially since you know, we do have to work, and even <laughs> if we know that our work is in our life and it's not going to fulfill us as a, in our spiritual sense, how do we find that silence and that stillness? Because some people are afraid of it. Um, some people just have no, have no, don't even know how to focus. Um, I don't know what to say about people who are afraid of it. Mm -hmm. uh, because I would say if you're afraid of silence and the things that, you know, silence <coughs> grows within you, then how, I'm, I'm trying not to say how the hell, but how are you going then to face questions that, address your own mortality, really. Um, I have worked as an economist for a year, and actually I am employed now. I am full-time employed at the School of Theology at the University in Oxford. Um, but there are ways in which you can, you can function without being present. You can. You can function without being there, mm -hmm. somehow. And you will have to just discover what helps you get there. And you will discover that by experience, not by reading. You read and then you try. You know, try everything. And what works for you, hold on to it. For me, what works best of everything is to pray at night. By far, nothing helps me more than that. Just force myself to be awake and pray. Or just be awake. Just be awake. Because even if I don't pray, the only reason I force myself to be awake is Christ. You know, I may not address him, I may just look out the window, but the only reason I'm standing and not going to bed is because I want tomorrow to be closer to him. And when I don't sleep, and when I've managed to say a few prayers in the night, the following day it's almost as if I've, I've, I've spoken of this before and I feel bad to repeat it there, it's almost as if you have a secret with him. There's you and Christ become accomplices into something. You know he's there, you know the night will come again, and in that night he will return and you will return, and that is your meeting space and time. And slowly that reality takes over and begins to reshape your life. If you don't find something like that, I'm not saying it has to be praying at night. That's what works for me. For other people, for my monastic brother, for instance, it's fasting. Very harsh fasting. That works for him. But if you don't do that, you'll discover that actually it's your job or your career or your family that take priority. And then you kind of mold your spiritual life around them 
instead of having your spiritual life and mold and adapt everything else around them. I've met people who tell me, oh, Father, I wish at least once in my life I would be able to go through the whole services in the Holy Week. And I don't understand why don't you? Well, you have a job, so don't you have a holiday? Why do you have to spend your holiday in Malibu? A week of your holiday, you invest in the Holy Week. It's your choice. It's your choice <coughs> not to be here. You can. You have your holiday. <coughs> oh, but I don't I actually I need the holiday. Well, then it's your choice. Don't tell me you can't. Mm. Own up to it. What I'm doing is a sin. I could be there every single day of the Holy Week for every single service, and I choose to be in Malibu. <laughs> Own up to it. And in two years' time, your heart will force you to just ask for that week off. If you don't own up to it, you will get to retirement and never do it. Yeah. It, it was just to say, obviously, that depends on the job. Some jobs, like I was, I, this year, I felt in, in agony because as a teacher, I can't have holidays when I want. So I never went to any of the morning services in Holy Week, but I made sure that I went to the night services. But, but you still have that, you know, I would use absolutely any way, and I recommend lying through your teeth, if nothing else works. <laughs> <laughs> because you do it through, for a good reason, you're not doing it for, you know, you don't tell them, I'm sick because you want to lie in bed. Yeah. You lie in order to be with Christ, yeah. and when you're with Christ, you pray for those people as well. Anything that works, break a leg if you have to, and then just jump, <laughs> and of course it's a mess. Yeah. But you know, don't tell me you can't do it. <laughs> The thing I think, I think, obviously, in that situation, that week, I had a conversation with my spiritual father, and he told me what was the best thing for me to do. Yeah. And he said that, <laughs> because I'm addicted to church, he said the best thing would be to have the pain of going to work. So yeah. that's what I did. Well, that's, yeah, that's, again, this, these spiritual. are private things, yes. and obviously, whatever your father confesses, say, it takes precedence. I mean, it's much more important than what I can possibly say, but... Uh, I wouldn't, I, I've lied immensely in order to be in church. My parents for many years knew that I was going out with my girlfriend. My parents knew that during the summer I was going on holiday with my girlfriend and I was in monasteries in Moldavia. We'd broken up, you know, two years before. My parents didn't know. I made everything possible that my mother hated her so that she doesn't want to meet her. You know, things like, oh, I'm just buying these cigarettes for her. She smokes. She's horrible. I never want to see her. <laughs> you know, it's just about, we are creative people. And let me tell you something. You know, Christ lies sometimes. Have you noticed, it says in, in, in the New Testament, where his brothers say, we are going to Jerusalem. Why don't you come with us and preach in the open? And he says, I'm not going. And then they go, and then he goes. <laughs> that's a lie. However you interpret it, that's a lie. But there's a good reason for it. There are the fathers in the desert, you know, who lied to cover up for the sinfulness of other people and so on. Um, don't, don't let this world and its rules and its laws and kind of tame you down and reduce you to a good citizen. We should be horrible citizens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be here. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions? <laughs> You'll have me on your side, Father. Yeah. I don't know if I've given myself enough time to think how can I articulate this, but it seems like I'm in the presence of Oscar Wilde speaking on. I loved Oscar Wilde. I loved Oscar Wilde. Every time I go to London, there's a wonderful sculpture of him just behind. No, not that one. It's behind St. Martyrs in the field, next to Trafalgar Square. Um, and he's lying down, right, like a king, and he's smoking a cigarette. And he says, we are all in the gutter, but some of us look at the stars. And I think that's wonderful. What I find so helpful is like you're saying, or at least maybe I'm allegedly interpreting what you're saying, um, this world is here for our delectable consume. We should... Uh, consumption, yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's something that we should consume and not lock ourselves away in long black, dark clothes and beers. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, I find that really affirming. Uh, thank you. Um, and even if you end up being in dra you know, black long clothes, that doesn't erase who you are. You've got a personality. You've got, um, and sometimes, again, be very, very honest about, I read a lot of stuff. And I'd say 90% of what I read is not religious things. You know, read poetry, read novels, listen to music. It's the world of God speaks through everything. You know, it's not just the just church. Um, and it's not like this is the church and then we build a wall and that's the, wo the world. It's so much more... Um, if your heart reacts to something, for God's sake, just let it react. There must be a reason. There's something there. You know, make a detour, see what's in there, and then come back. Um, yeah. Done? Father, I couldn't help but share something just reacting to those two comments, because I also love Oscar Wilde, and I also love Nietzsche, and I also love radical existentialists, and anybody who has an appetite for absolute experience wherever it goes, because I want to if I may, with your permission, Father, yeah. address something that Laura said. The wonderful thing about putting 100% into an idol is that the idol breaks. Yeah. The world, in that sense, can't take the 100%, and it simply breaks. But as Father says, if you invest just a little and hold back a lot and play it safe, and make sure that you can have just a little of this and just a little of that, and an imitation this and an imitation that. Then you just fade into absolute nothingness, and your personality might as well have never existed to begin with. But there are things that God's the only one that can hold it and not break. And you only really know that after you've seen idol after idol after idol break. You can't see the idol break unless you love the idol with that degree of passion that actually is calling you to God. There's something about, <clears throat> speaking of non-church related sources of spirituality, there's something about, um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of Dadaism or the Dada artists at the beginning of last century. I think if, if People ask me, oh, what's the greatest spiritual influence upon you? And I always lie, because the truth is that it's the, it's the Dada artists of that period. And their thinking was pretty much that in order to realize that something is not working, you have to build it up. So as an artist, their calling was to build a sculpture of you and realize what a failure it is by comparison. And then you smash it. And then you build another one. And then you smash that one. That's basically what they do. And there is one of them called Hugo Ball, who says in his, in his diary that actually Dada comes from Dennis the Areopagite, Dennis the Areopagite. It's almost an apophatic way of living instead of just an apophatic way of thinking. You build things up fully aware that they're idols and you're going to smash them. Anything you do, anything, be it a married life, a monastic life, a monastery as I do, Everything will fail because nothing will exhaust the glorious thing that you are. Nothing will, will, will just... Father Sophroni says, no rule on earth, including, you know, monastic rules, monastic tradition, Old Testament, New Testament, nothing exhausts the, the limitlessness of who you are. And if you forget that, you've become a poodle, a tamed little pet instead of a lion. And that's, that's, that's failing already. Uh, let's have dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.